You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than, what would you do if you woke up one day to find a dead body next to you in the bed? That question would have to be, Mark, what are the photographic opportunities walking around Nakamaguru in Tokyo on a Sunday morning with a Fuji GA645ZI medium format point and shoot camera loaded with Ilford Pan F50 film? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. So we have our Ilford Pan F Plus 50 speed, a low speed film and probably not suited to the wintry conditions of Nakamaguru on um, a cold February day, but we'll give it a go. Now the Fuji GA645ZI is already proving to be a somewhat challenging choice. I just shot at 15th of a second and only just realized it after I'd pressed the trigger. I doubt that'll come out, but uh, we'll see. You'll know sooner than I will. So I think I'm going to have to change tack with film the price it is and the challenges of shooting Pan F50 in the dark corners of Nakamaguru. What I might do instead is hang out in the bright areas of the suburb. Finally some light, these narrow streets are not making it easy for me.
So one frame left and now we get just a little hint of sunshine. So let's look at this cheap looking oversized piece of plastic. Ah, uh, Fuji GA645ZI, my favorite and least liked camera. Let me explain. Firstly, let's try and characterize this beast. I call him Harvey after Harvey Weinstein. Big, ugly, powerful, promising you the world, but more likely to leave you traumatized with your creative ambitions in tatters. You've got to hand it to Fujifilm though for bucking trends. Throughout the last decades of the film era, while Canon and Nikon were squeezing the last juice out of the 35mm SLR industry, companies like Fuji and Mamiya knew that the value of film lay in the quality and dynamic range of the medium and continued to innovate with larger format offerings that gave great quality while minimizing the size. Now these days, everyone lusts after the Mamiya 7 series of medium format cameras, and this little device is a bit neglected, but in the 90s, Fujifilm had a complete range of medium format film cameras. And yes, this is from the 90s. Can you tell? Think boy bands, rollerblading, and the Rachel haircut. The same design sensibility carries through. I mean, who doesn't love champagne colored plastic? You saw it on your dad's Honda Accord, and you see it here. Sleek and spangly, promising opulence like a knockoff Burberry handbag. In the end, this is never going to win a camera beauty contest in the same way that a sumo wrestler is not going to be crowned Miss Universe. Its size alone makes this look gauche and clumsy. But as I keep protesting, looks aren't everything. How does it perform? Well, we'll hold our final judgment on image quality until later, two more rolls of film to go. In terms of usability and function though, as with most point and shoots, this is, I guess, a bit of a mixed bag. You can probably tell already that it has a sharp lens. 10 elements in 10 groups, it's quite a complex design, but with two limitations. Firstly, it has a measly 1.6x zoom, a uh, range of 55 to 90 millimeters, and that makes it equivalent to 34 to 56 millimeters in 35 millimeter terms, or not very wide to not very long in human vernacular. And it moves in four steps rather than allowing you to seamlessly zoom. Secondly, it struggles with a slow maximum aperture of f4.5 to 6.9 throughout the zoom range. So Ilford Pan F50 is probably not the best choice. Look, it's a point and shoot with all of the trade-offs that come with that. It takes a while to start up and as you'll see later, it's not particularly responsive. It certainly gives you more control than a regular point and shoot though, having two aperture priority modes with the AS maintaining normal metered exposure so you can use fill flash rather than as a replacement for light. You can also shoot manual with it, although I find that pretty awkward. Most of the time I leave it on program mode, which is basically automatic, but with the advantage of still requiring you to manually pop up the flash. And that works for me because one of my biggest bugbears of most 35 millimeter point and shoots is their tendency to default to auto flash when you turn them on. It has autofocus too, obviously, and for the most part it works well. Actually, it works exactly like a point and shoot, where you focus in the center of the frame with a half press and then recompose before releasing the shutter. It's not foolproof, at least not for a fool like me. It misses focus occasionally. It does have one great feature though, in that it lets you know where the general distance in the viewfinder is before you take the shot. That gives you the chance to check beforehand, and the fact that I find myself looking at it most of the time is probably a good indication that you need to be careful. Still, it's certainly a step up from a regular point and shoot where you never know if it's going to come out and it can even manually focus, which is, well, kind of pointless here since 
distance. There's no feedback to tell you whether your subject is sharp or not. You have to guess the distance and it's so slow as to be not worth it most of the time. The only time I think I could really see myself using it is if I wanted to shoot at a set distance and I can't move the camera because it's on a tripod or if I have to focus on infinity through glass and I'm worried about reflections tricking the autofocus mechanism. So look, it's an awkward creature in many respects, both frustratingly automatic and irritatingly quirky. Being a viewfinder camera, I have shot more than a few frames with the lens cap on. And here's the thing, it does have a lens cap sensor that you can turn on that I didn't even know about until I started to dig through the manual for the camera specs for this video. You actually have to push up the zoom lever and turn the camera mode dial to the ISO setting. So super intuitive. You can also turn the beep on by using the ISO setting with the self timer, but I just leave it off. And I promise you, I'll completely forget how to change any of these settings by the end of this video. Another quirky feature of this camera is the vertical viewfinder. Being 4x5, it's pretty much a half frame camera, fitting two portrait images in a single 6x9 frame. The best thing about this design, honestly, is the grip and the shutter button. The camera feels great in your hand despite its size and I found my finger naturally just kind of rests on the shutter button even if I rotate it into landscape photo position. So it's quite handleable. And you can use this camera quite well one-handed, but it's fiddly. I did drop it in the center of Shibuya several years ago, but I think that was more because I was relying on the generic wrist strap purchased on eBay that broke on me than a problem with the grip. Um, it survived fine, but learn from my mistakes here, kids. Don't attach a crappy eBay wrist strap to your Leica M11. So, Harvey is something of a clumsy leviathan of a point and shoot and that's not something you typically want with you when you're out on the street. In dim light with slow film, you're battling with the exposure triangle, particularly at the modest 55 millimeter equivalent long end with its f6.9 maximum aperture. But what if we change film and actually give it a fighting chance? Can I do proper street photography with it? So, Pana 50 on a cloudy day in Tokyo, perhaps not. But we do have a solution. Ilford HP5 at 1600. I should actually be able to get some shots that are in focus and steady this time. One four hundredth of a second. <sighs> well, unfortunately, I don't have a beautiful Japanese model to photograph, so you're stuck with this. just taken what could have been really quite a nice little photo of a girl being pushed along in a stroller holding a big bunch of flowers and I'm realizing that there's kind of about a half second delay on the shutter of this so if everything looks like I just missed the moment that's only because I just missed the moment.
lunchtime, courtesy of my friends at Family Mart. We have some sushi, and you gotta hand it in the way they give you chopsticks, even though they don't have soy, ginger, or wasabi. And what I initially thought was some lovely lemon lime mineral water, but as you'll see, a little bit extra. Well, I think you'll agree that that was a bit more successful and no prizes for guessing that HP5 at 1600 is my preferred combination for this kind of photography. Being medium format, when pushed to stops, the grain is quite small and refined and black and white streets lend themselves to a little bit of grit anyway. Now, there are those that would argue that 6x4.5 isn't true medium format, but a 6x4.5 image is still two times the frame size of 35 millimeter so that's more than two and a half times the megapixels in today's currency you've still got room to crop but i find i'm less likely to do that uh, than with my square frame medium format cameras anyway here you've got a 4x3 ratio which is exactly the same as my micro four thirds camera and much more flexible than a square format if you crop a 6x6 frame for horizontal or portrait orientation, you lose the benefits of the larger real estate anyway. Sure, you could go bigger, but if you were 6x9, you'd need a bigger camera with a bigger lens and you'd only get 8 frames. I do have a 6x9 camera, but I don't use it as often because just of the cost of consumables. Film has gone up in price and, and look, we all have to make sacrifices to fund our hobbies, but my wife told me that apparently my kids still need at least one functioning kidney each to survive. So this can be more economical on film, but you do miss out on a little bit of that medium format look, where even with a moderate aperture and focal length, you can throw out the background to get that soft blur and 3D pop. The out of focus areas are actually quite dreamy with this lens, but all of the compromises of the smaller frame and slow lens combined with a focusing distance of one meter frustrate you. You're limited to shooting people no closer than waist high, which doesn't often make for a dramatic portrait, even though it could be a great tool for a corporate headshot. But if you want a studio camera, get a Hasselblad or a Mamiya RZ. This is a point and shoot, and a point and shoot with one huge difference. It's sharp. The lens resolves details with surgical precision that can beat any 35 millimeter camera and lens combination. With this in your hand, you're really carrying an analog powerhouse. 
But look, I'm not done yet. One more roll of film to go. Now for some Tokyo night photography, this time using Lomography 800 color negative film. So in the last video, I talked about the challenges of living in Australia where there seems nothing to photograph. Well, welcome to Tokyo where there's everything to photograph.
So one day and three rolls of film with the Fuji GA645ZI. Would I recommend this camera? Look, I'm ambivalent. I find the shooting experience to be the same as shooting with a regular point and shoot. The small viewfinder, slow response, lack of feedback and overall plasticky feel of the camera gives me a sense of remoteness from the experience and to use a well-worn cliche, using it doesn't spark joy the way that some of my other old film cameras do. And yet I find myself using it more than any other medium format camera I own. It's not exactly pocketable, but it's compact, convenient, and once you get to know its quirks, using it as an auto everything photo maker can be quite liberating. This has been with me around the world since I got it in 2015, and I've taken some great shots with it. The good thing about it being so ugly is that I never feel like I'm going to get mugged while I carry it through some of the sketchier parts of town. Straight after the safe streets of Tokyo, I took this through the chaos of Peta region of Colombo in Sri Lanka, and it drew only the occasional glance of confusion or mild disdain. And hey, I'm used to that. That doesn't mean I'm relaxed about Harvey though. Everything's electronic and I suspect I'm living on borrowed time. Like a lot of automatic zoom cameras of the era, many of the parts are fragile and there are lots of stories in particular about ribbon circuits flexing and breaking after long-term use. That's definitely going to kill the zoom mechanism eventually and one of the known problems with this is the cable that connects through the back of the camera to the LCD making it difficult to read the frame counter when it wears out. The fact that you can buy new generic replacement ribbon cable parts for this camera is probably the best indication that it's a ticking time bomb. Even if you can source the parts, you're going to have a hard time getting it fixed. I bought this camera for 650 Australian dollars eight years ago, but now the price has jumped up so much that I really would hesitate to replace it if it broke. Would I recommend it to others? In some situations, yes, and in others, no. Like I said, I'm ambivalent. You know the old joke about ambivalence. What's the difference between ignorance, apathy, and ambivalence? I don't know, and I don't care one way or the other. That's not true about this camera. Whether I suggest this camera to others, it's not a straight yes or no. This is a camera that has some limitations and requires you to get to know it properly. Once you do, you can be stunned by the results and it inspires anything other than apathy. Just carrying it labels you as a 90s icon. It's champagne accents perfectly complementing the frosted tips of your bleached blonde hair as you cut a swathe through the crowd of that Fresh Prince concert to capture those classic hip-hop poses on celluloid. And I know that I, for one, can't help but get a little bit jiggy with it every time I try to squeeze it into the pockets of my cargo pants while I'm out on the streets of Tokyo. Later.